everyone. We are so excited to have you here as we highlight some of our amazing allies for Black History Month. And we're here to highlight Dia Parker, who is the executive director of Athena's Warehouse, which is a nonprofit dedicated to breaking barriers to economic opportunity for women of color. And Athena's Warehouse runs a number of programming, especially geared towards Cross Keys High School, which Dia graduated from. And Dia is also um, a former participant in Athena's Warehouse. So it's so beautiful to see that Athena, I mean, that Dia uh, spent time in this program and is now leading this organization to ensure that we are meeting the needs of youth who are normally not considered. They come from communities that are often not talked about. So Dia, we are so grateful to have you here. Thanks so much, Aparna, for inviting me. I'm so glad to be here um, for your Black History Month highlight. Um, for over a decade, uh, Athena's Warehouse has worked primarily with Cross Keys High School to provide an after-school program that we now call our Discovery Your Inner Warrior program. This program meets 42 weeks a year, so that's fall, some spring, spring and summer semester. Um, and we meet with our students to talk to them about developing and improving their professional development skills, as well as their personal development skills. So everything from yoga and learning more about their mental health to writing good resumes and getting into that call their, their dream college. And I think this is amazing. And I don't know if most people know, but I actually graduated from Cross Keys High School. So this program means so much to me personally, because I know we could, I could have benefited from an amazing program like this. So I love supporting it. And then we know that there's, you know, there's a diverse population at Cross Keys. Can you tell us a little bit about the students at Cross Keys High School and their, the communities they represent? Absolutely. Cross Keys High School is one of the most ethnically diverse high schools in the DeKalb County school system um, with over 90, 87% to 90% of the students identifying as Latinx, about 7% API and 7% Black. Um, and so students are from, uh, their students' parents come from many different countries all over the world. Um, I remember when I was a student there back in 2012, we had 40 different countries represented at any given time uh, by our student body. And uh, our international nights were, were the best, uh, I, just, I just have to say. Um, and it's such a vibrant um, community uh, there at Cross Keys, you know. So not only is there the multilingual piece, but there's the multicultural pieces as well. Um, and I know that that can be kind of difficult for the school system in some ways to, you know, figuring out how to communicate with parents. And so there is a bit of, um, you know, uh, disadvantage and, um, you know, a, a bit of underserving that happens um, at the school as well. So, you know, the school isn't, um, doesn't have a single board member <laughs> uh, that represents the school, although there is a regional superintendent that represents the school directly. Uh, you know, things, things of that nature, you know, lead to cross keys, uh, slipping through the cracks on on a few on a few things, but um, over no 100% now due to the pandemic, 100% of students are uh, on free and reduced lunch at the school, um, and we know from internal data that a lot of our students' parents, their highest education level is either elementary school or high school, depending on their country of origin. Um, so if their parent is from the United States, then their highest education level is. Uh, high school. Um, and, you know, there are a lot of studies that show that the highest education level of the parent does really correspond very closely with the highest education level of, of the student. So it's kind of unlikely in that way that a student might pursue college or even get their associate's degree if their parent's education level is, is high school. Awesome. So we're here to talk about Black History Month, right? Um, but also celebrating Black leaders, right, who are doing great work. Can you tell us a little bit of why is the conversation of race so important? Why do we need to have it? Yeah, we have to talk about race because it's the first thing that walks into the door long before I do. You know, <laughs> as a Black woman, I get asked a lot, you know, how did you uh, become an organizer? How did you get into uh, community work? And it's like, it wasn't an option. You know, my mom took me to marches as a 
small toddler, or, you know, there, there was always that aspect of, of social justice and of, uh, you know, fighting the good fight and, you know, speaking up against, um, against uh, wrongdoing um, all of my life. And so, you know, race is, is particularly important um, for me as a black woman um, because it impacts my job, my life at every level. You know, there are so many things that my mother and that I experience um, that are you just just it's simply because we are you know, we are black women. You know, my mother's been denied for programming. She's been um, you know discriminated against heavily in in, in the workplace. Um, it's it's just it is, and that's that experience is not just me and my mom, uh, me and my mother. That that is the conversation, and that's the um, that's the reality for everyone who is a person of color. Um, there is inherent bias built into every level of our systems. And uh, if we don't address that implicit bias and if we don't, you know, say out loud that we are going to fight against implicit bias when it negatively negatively impacts people of color, then we, you know, we're, we're just ignoring the, the, ele the proverbial elephant in the room. Um, so, uh, you know, race is very real. <laughs> Race has very real implications for the day-to-day -day lives of everyone in our community. Um, and so we have to not only talk about it, but you know, make intentional um, changes in policies, changes in procedures, changes in hiring, um, to be very intentional about how it is that we're gonna reshape the world to work for everyone. That's powerful, yeah. How does that play out in your work at Cross Keys or with Athena's Warehouse? Yeah, so we who we really, really, really love to highlight um, the culture and uplift, um, you know, all of the different beautiful aspects of what makes our students so unique and so um, beautiful because our programming, you know, and the reason why we're called Athena's Warehouse um, is really trying to get at helping students, helping young women to realize that they have the power already within them. They have a goddess sleeping within them. And if they, you know, just get the right tools, they can wake her up and she can, you know, come out of them and they can live their best life. So um, the, the way that, you know, academically it's been written about in studies that you can, you know, help students of color in particular, especially black students, um, to realize their, uh, their, their true power um, and to, you know, have ac more academic perseverance. So regardless of whether they're experiencing racial bias or whether students are um, experiencing microaggressions, especially as they move up in the academic system. So if they go from high school to college, um, they might be more likely to experience microaggressions or racial bias um, because the institutions get more and more white led. Um, so the way in which to, you know, to provide students with that that power and to show them that um, they can overcome those experiences and those challenges is to build their self-confidence by uplifting their culture. So, you know, um, we have a really amazing chef, Chef Maricela Vega um, of Chico, at Atlanta, who works with local farmers to bring um, new takes on Mexican cu cuisine uh, to the forefront of everything that she does. And while talking about Mexican cuisine, she talks about decolonizing our food. So moving away from, um, you know, the big chain grocery store to shopping local, uh, to even farming, teaching our students how to grow food at home um, and, you know, really take control and take back, you know, the ways in which their ancestors cultivated the land and grew their food for their health and their, and their wellness. And so tying in all of those things together uh, to really show our students that like, you know, the way that grandma does it is for a reason and it's powerful. And we want you to have that power to pass down to your children um, in the future as well. So, so yeah. That's really powerful. I really wish, you know, Cross Keys was definitely a different place. There were probably about four South Asians in my class when I was at Cross Keys. And, and I think, you know, at that time, I didn't love and appreciate my culture as much as I do now. And so I think that's just such a powerful space to create, you know, where we are 
talking about culture and 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 looking at it and not trying to run away with it you know run away from it excuse me <laughs> um so what are some things that are critical to advancing conversations on race, social justice, and equity? What do you think is an important thing? Yeah. This is a great question, Aparna. Um, I immediately think about uh, power mapping. So I know that a lot of people feel that as an individual, there are so many systems or too many systems for them to, to tackle and to fight um, to actually create change, but that's totally incorrect. One individual's influence uh, can be enough to be a change-making force um, when we're talking about race and social justice and equity. And so I challenge anyone listening to this conversation to start to understand their own sphere of influence. So power mapping includes looking at who in your circle might be interested in donating to Rock Show. Um, power mapping includes understanding, you know, how um, when you share something on social media that you're being intentional about sharing new subjects, new things that you're learning, that you as an individual are forever educating yourself, figuring out and mapping your own personal gaps in knowledge about the subject of race, about the subjects of social justice, about the history of the city that you live in. If, if you're not familiar with the amazing history that the city of Atlanta has, you know, uh, around this conversation, then don't be scared to educate yourself because as each individual becomes more knowledgeable and understands where they fit in the system, only then can we begin to create change. And conversations like this, you know, reach out to places that have, uh, you know, um, information and resources about these topics and, and educate yourself. Excellent. Are there things that you want the larger community to know about race in our communities or even, you know, students at Athena's Warehouse or students at Cross Keys? Because I know like race has played a, a key role in even how, um, you know, the school's resources are allocated, right? Um, and you can talk more about that, but I think those are things that we should always keep in mind because I always feel like even when, when we were at Cross Keys, the school was overlooked and that was in the 80s, you know? So the fact that that is still something that we are grappling with, what is that about? Yeah, so if there, are, there, are a lot of, there are a lot of things here, you know, um, gerrymandering immediately comes to mind. <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, redistricting, we had that happen with Cross Keys because the district was so different in 1989 when I left and it kept changing and moving and... And, and, and now it's just this snake that runs along <laughs> Beaufort Highway and... I have students uh, right now, you know, juniors uh, who asked, who literally asked me, they're like, why do I live in Doraville? And I come all the way down here past Shambly Charter High School to Cross Keys. And I'm like, I have a word for you to Google, gerrymandering. <laughs> Um, but I, but I do love our district, and I do love the students um, that that come through Cross Keys High School, especially because. You know, we, our community is just so resilient and knows so well how to make positives out of the many negatives that get handed to us. Um, like I remember distinctly that the, uh, that the field um, next to the school, the track field um, yep. was in terrible repair during, you know, the time that I was there. And it was literally a, like, we called it the mud pit. Um, and it took the school district years uh, to, to respond. And, um, you know, I think it's, it's also the feelings from within the community as well. So, you know, these not, you know, not blaming the community. Um, but you know, when I, when I do get have conversations with the superintendent, when I do have conversations, even though this is a new superintendent, this would have been the old superintendent, but I do have conversations with the, the COs and, and all these people from the, from the school district, you know, on their end, they're saying things like, um, well, you know, there were no parents that came to our community input session, or we sent a letter uh, in the mail and it was only in English, but no parents responded. And so they must just not be interested in having a community conversation with us to solve these issues. The parents are just disinterested. They're unavailable. And I'm like, 
uh, honey, first of all, <laughs> our parents are working three jobs, not two, not in this economy. Our parents are working three jobs and relying on the income that their student is making if they have a high school student. Um, and they're living with multiple family members. So there'll be five adults in a household, plus all of the children that are attached to each family member. So, you know, this is the way that our families are, that are, are living on Buford Highway. And I think that, you know, the school district really forgets that like, you know, you can just send a text message. You can just send, you know, messaging in multiple languages and, parents are interested. They're just not getting, you're not meeting people where they are. They're not getting the message in a way that will make them respond. And then a lot of it is just, it's just politics, right? So like things are written in political language that is unclear to even native English speakers. So, <laughs> so yeah. if, if we're going to talk about community engagement, if we're going to talk about equity, if we're going to talk about racial justice and school systems in particular, then we have to start talking about, well, what does, how do we make, you know, this conversation make sense for the, you know, someone who is completely on the outside looking in, whether this is pictures, whether this is, you know, there are, there are ways uh, to do it. And there are so many phenomenal uh, partners, especially like Alan Clarkston, who have been working with multilingual communities um, for a really long time. We have the Center for Pan-Asian Community Services, which Raksha, we have Raksha, like we have resources, multilingual resources in the community uh, to get the information communicated to parents. But the school district, um, you know, always has, always has excuses and they have limited resources. And you know, all, all those, all those sorts of good, fun things, but we have to keep fighting. And so one last thing that I wanted to add to, to this question in particular is about um, the feeling from the community that, that they are disadvantaged. So if we keep calling our communities disadvantaged and we keep calling them underserved, but we don't provide any new services, then, you know, where, where's the conversation going? So, you know, our families need to feel that they have the power to make change for themselves, that they, you know, pay the salaries, pay the taxes, that pay the salaries of these uh, individuals, especially these board members, these ca uh, county commissioners, all these people, you know, we pay their salaries. They work for us. And it's really difficult, though, for our community, especially for, you know, folks who are undocumented, um, our mixed status family households, um, to, to feel that power and to overcome um, that, especially coming out of the very recent hostile uh, political climate at, as a nation. You know, it's going to, our nation needs healing. Our city needs healing. Our greater metro Atlanta area needs healing. Um, and until, until we start the healing, uh, it's going to be very difficult for us to, to get resources, um, you know, to, to the community. And I don't think people know like how how this impacted the Cross Keys community, but I, if I recall correctly, there there were definitely ice raids happening in the community. So it also makes it really scary for parents to come forward based on, you know, when immigration is knocking at your door and the apartment complex is right by the school, that that impacts people coming forward and wanting to be engaged and get information. I also like put like I know that there's a huge uh, Bangla community. Um, in that, and I don't know how much outreach is done in Bangla because there's a huge Bangla community represented throughout Buford Highway. And I don't ever see anything that is geared towards that community. Um, and I know that there's limited English proficiency in that community as well. So I just, it's always kind of <laughs> interesting to see. Why is this work so important to you, Dia? <laughs> yeah, like you said at the beginning, um, you know, I went through the program when I was in high school and I was 3.8 GPA, top 10%, very academically proficient students, um, was not struggling academically in any way, uh, but I was depressed. I was sad um, because I knew that this was the last cushion, the last time that I would be surrounded by so many beautiful 
people of color who, you know, knew our power and knew, you know, how important our cultures were to us. And we celebrated everything and everyone. Um, but I knew that, you know, the world wasn't going to be that way. I knew that the college, no matter what college I went to, it was never going to be that same close knit cross keys community. Um, and so it was really powerful for me to see uh, the founder of Athena's Warehouse, B. Wynn, for her to just, you know, say to herself, because this isn't, you know, we're not a national organization. We don't work with any other school pretty much except for Cross Keys High School. Um, and she didn't go to Cross Keys. She came, you know, she lived in Augusta most of her life in Augusta, Georgia. Um, and so I'm like, why did you choose, why Cross Keys? Why did you choose Cross Keys? Um, and for, for her to pick Cross Keys High School and for uh, the program to be there at a time when I was so skinny and awkward and, you know, scared to, to speak up about anything because there was so much going on in my mind about, you know, how awful the world was and what all, and all these expectations that we have, especially on young women, you know, not only do you have to like go out here and get a superpower job, but you've also got to raise your children and, and educate the, the next generation and, and all these kinds of pressures are on us as young women. And um, just having a space where I could relax, where things were about me, where my opinion was valid and where my emotions were at the forefront of my emotions and my emotional needs were at the forefront of every bit of programming that was conducted was so powerful. It, as cheesy as it sounds, it really did change my life. And I got involved in doing that same kind of change making for students at my university when I worked in the counseling department when I was at Oglethorpe. Um, and then, you know, to, to now. Um, and so, so that's, that's why it's so important for me, you know, I just want for our young women and non-binary and gender non-conforming students to know that there's hope that they are valid um, and that they have they have the power to do whatever it is that they want to do. That's so powerful. Thank you, Dia. I'm going to ask one more question to talk more about race and the Black experience, right? Yeah. And so one of the things is, you know, I like Cross Keys is a pretty diverse community, but it doesn't have high numbers of African-American or Black Americans at the school. That mm -hmm. wasn't the top number that you put in there. And, and the fact, I think what I'd love to explore with you is even though you were a minority at Cross Keys, right? That you still created a safe place and what was important for that? Because I can imagine it, it's also not easy being a Black American at Cross Keys. <laughs> You're definitely a minority. I mean, it wasn't so, so that's the beauty of like the majority minority school, right? So like, even if there is like a dominant culture, if it's not the white culture that's dominant, it just doesn't purvey in like a toxic manner. So like I went to a PWI, I went to Oglethorpe University and although I did love all five- PWI, of your, what is PWI? Yeah, a predominantly white institution, sorry. <laughs> okay. Um, so, you know, I, although I enjoyed all five years of that experience, I would not have been able to survive it had I have not grown up in an environment like the Cross Keys High School environment. It wasn't just my high school, right? So I went to Woodward Elementary and, you know, another local Christian academy during my middle, for middle school education. And so just being embedded in that community where, you know, we all walk to go get groceries, you know, nobody goes downtown pretty much unless you have like an appointment with like, you know, the Georgia Health Department or something like, you don't really go downtown, you don't need to. Um, and there was never like this sense that like, that I needed to know anything except Spanish. <laughs> like, there, <laughs> like, I definitely should have learned that, but uh, better. But like, outside of that, you know, no one was, there weren't those like clicks. Like, you know, if you picture like a really typical, like, picture of an American high school, there, there weren't those clicks, like people were just people. Um, and uh, the, you know, and as a black student, though, there was still a lot of responsibility. Um, and a lot of privilege that I had, um, that I know for a fact, was not experienced by, you know, my friends who were Latinx identifying, you know, so 
the English as a Second Language program is an insanely discriminatory program. You know, students that have uh, English as a Second Language credits do not get looked at by colleges at the same level. And so if students are never tested out of the program, which just happens way too often in DeKalb County, um, if students don't test out before they get to high school and they stay in ESO, it's unlikely that they'll even be able to go to a state college. Like their only option will be to go to a community college. And no one tells their parents that, no one tells the students that. And so there I was in my freshman year of high school, finding myself as the black girl <laughs> advocating to get my best friends out of ESL, um, out of the ESL program, because it made, it made no sense to me. You know, if we were able to communicate with each other, how how could she still be learning English as her second language? Like, um, so it was it was it was that experience. It was an experience of of solidarity and of shared power, um, you know, and not one of like feeling isolated or alone. I mean, you you could be isolated and alone if you wanted to, <laughs> but but there wasn't that um, that feeling that you know people. Uh, people othered one another because of different cultural practices or anything like that. Um, uh, yeah, it, and it's and I know that that's that's super rare and super unique, um, and it's not given space at a lot of PWIs. There just is the dominant culture, and everyone kind of falls in line with it um, and and clicks up and um, and moves uh, with this herd mentality. And anybody outside of that herd mindset is is left to to their own devices but that's not how our communities are you know communities of color are not like that for the most part uh you know we will check on that person that that might you know not have anybody sitting with them at lunch today like there's there there was always that that feeling of community yeah and I think I've seen that with some of the uh alumni throughout the years um yeah. or the later years definitely it's been beautiful to see the the unique community that's come out of Cross Keys. I, I'm still astounded at ninth grade. How did you know that you needed to get your friends out of ESL or ESOL? Um, how would how would you even know that? I would not have known that at ninth grade that like I need to advocate for my students <laughs> or advocate for my friends. <laughs> I that's and this is you know back to my my one of my points earlier. It's like you know you've just come out of the womb fighting like fighting for your life and fighting for the lives of others around you like we, I, I didn't really have a choice um so you know I just I wanted you know so you know my my friend she hadn't considered at all um college as an option and I asked you know I dug into that I was like well you know we have the same grade point average right now like why would you not consider college an option um at the time I think I would I wanted to take AP bio and I wanted her to take an AP class with me but her counselor told her she couldn't get into AP because she was still in the ESL program. And I was like, hold the phone. Why are you still in ESL? Like you, you been done learned English girl. Like we need to get this ball rolling. How do we, who do we call? Where does this, where does this happen? And so the uh, guidance counselor, you know, told us that, you know, her mom just needed to call and say that she wanted her out of the program. Um, and she didn't even have to take a test or anything. Like her mom just literally had to be like, oh yeah, I think, I think this is enough. Like she did it from elementary school to, <laughs> to ninth grade. I think this is good. And so by the time we got to the 10th grade, she was uh, out of the ESL program and was taking advanced classes, AP classes. Um, and you know, now has been working for over a decade, um, as an interpreter, um, and, uh, in, um, real estate and, uh, housing. That's amazing. That's so amazing. Well, Dia, I mean, so you, you were advocating from a young <laughs> age, uh, what a superstar you are, um, to be able to do that for your friends. And, and I'm, I'm so grateful that you continue to do it for the young women at Cross Keys High School, because I know I would have loved to have had that, but, I know that it's great that you are there doing it for them on a daily basis. Dia, thank you so much for being with us and letting us uplift with you, uh, uplift your amazing work with Athena's Warehouse. And of course, with the Cross Keys Foundation, I forgot to mention you're on the board of the Cross Keys Foundation as well and oversee the scholarships 
for students. So um, it is such a gift to know you. And I know I got to know you through Athena's and through Cross Keys Foundation. But I love highlighting your work. And I love that we get to work together to make a difference in young people's lives. Yes, thanks so much, Aparna. Um, we wouldn't be here without Raksha and the, the services that you all provide to the community for over 30 years. Um, and it's just, it's just, you know, phenomenal to, to know you and to, to have been a part of this. And I hope that you guys, you know, keep doing these highlights every year. Um, yep. And, and yeah, this was, this was great. Awesome. Thank you.